The followers of Jesus Christ spread his word throughout the Mediterranean basin, and the Christian faith flourished despite eras of violent persecution by the state. With the turn of the third century, Constantine the Great legitimized the Christian religion and found support in it to consolidate his claim as sole emperor of the Roman realm. Along the way, the Christian church had developed into a group of local congregations which tended to their matters internally and turned to higher authority the apostles and their successors in times of problems and doubts. By the middle of the third century, following the early example of the apostles, bishops of a province had occasionally gathered at provincial capitals to discuss and resolve common problems. As a result, the bishops of these capitals assumed certain administrative duties and were given the honorary title Metropolitan. Gradually, local councils of bishops expanded in scope to include bishops from other provinces. These larger councils usually assembled in the more prominent cities, Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch. Consequently, their bishops acquired added prestige and importance in the affairs of the church beyond their own immediate provinces and were recognized as archbishops. Eventually, they became known as patriarchs, leaders of a patria, a family, a tribe. With the Byzantine integration of church and state, differences of opinion, which led to religious controversy and dispute, extended beyond provincial boundaries to assume a global significance. They demanded even broader ecumenical solutions. Emperors, eager to see controversies resolved for the sake of imperial unity, summoned bishops from every corner of the empire to seven successive ecumenical councils. The bishops attending these councils were admittedly imperfect men, but they are believed to have met and deliberated in the actual presence of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the decrees of ecumenical councils, convened and presided over by an emperor, were enacted into law, binding on the church as well as the state. By consensus of the collective body of bishops, the seven ecumenical councils either clarified Christian dogma, matters of faith and belief, or issued canons on administrative matters, defining the visible organizational structure of the church. The first two ecumenical councils were co convened during the fourth century to address issues arising from the so-called Arian controversy. The teachings of Arius, a priest from Alexandria, who denied the true divinity of Christ. Both councils dealt primarily with the nature of the Holy Trinity. They clearly defined the divinity of Christ and the Holy Spirit in coexistence with the Father as one God, three persons in one essence. The first council was summoned to Nicaea in Asia Minor by Emperor Constantine the Great in the year 325 AD, condemning Arian theology. The bishops, as stewards of the whole church, articulated the Nicene Creed to reflect Orthodox faith. Uh, orthodoxa, by definition, the correct belief and the proper glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the right worship in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Catholic meaning general, universal, apostolic, referring to the unbroken chain of succession from the apostles themselves. To this day, the Nicene Creed is still used by Eastern Orthodox Christians around the world. Despite the decrees of Nicaea, the Arian controversy did resurface, often encouraged by Constantine's immediate successors. The Second Ecumenical Council, convened in Constantinople in 381 by Emperor Theodosius, after he had recognized Christianity as a state religion, reaffirmed the Nicene Creed to put the Arian heresy to rest once and for all. The next four councils addressed issues about the identity of Christ. 
They defined, accepted, and affirmed the person of Christ as the bridge between man and God, one substance existing in two natures, human as well as divine. He is fully human. He is fully divine. As a result, the Virgin Mary was affirmed to be the Theotokos, the mother of God. The language used at Chalcidon by the Fourth Ecumenical Council to define the dual nature of Christ caused the first serious schism of the Church. Monophysites, so-called because they were thought by critics to reject the dual nature of Christ, in fact objected not so much to the concept of duality, but rather to the expression of it. Further aggravated by imperial authority, as well as bitterness caused by national and cultural differences, they distanced themselves from the imperial church in the 5th and 6th centuries. The Coptic Church of Egypt, along with the Armenian Apostolic, Syrian Jacobite, and Ethiopian churches, collectively known as the Oriental Orthodox churches, were separated from the main body of Orthodox Christianity. The seventh and last council, recognized by orthodoxy as ecumenical, addressed an often violent dispute that had raged for more than half a century over the use of icons in liturgical life. For orthodox Christians, icons, or holy images of persons and events, are an integral part of an act of prayer, not as objects of worship, but as representations for veneration. They serve only as reminders to instruct and assist the faithful. They translate the mystery depicted into a vibrant, meaningful, present reality. The iconoclastic movement launched by Emperor Leo II had compared icons to idols, condemning their use in worship and advocating instead only symbols like the cross. Iconoclasts had systematically destroyed or removed icons from all churches and public places and had vigorously persecuted advocates of icons. The Seventh Ecumenical Council, supported by the Empress Irene, soundly condemned the iconoclastic movement and validated the display of icons in all churches and everywhere else across the empire as windows to heaven. Nonetheless, the debate flared up again in the 9th century with a revival of iconoclasm. Finally, the Empress Theodora permanently brought the issue to an end by invoking the ecumenical decision of the Seventh Council and enforcing it as if it were state law. The settlement of the iconoclastic controversy, in addition to its religious significance, was a decisive victory for the artistic heritage of humanity. Orthodox churches everywhere today still celebrate the first Sunday of Lent as the triumph of orthodoxy, to commemorate the final victory for icons and their undisputed restoration to the church. All factions of Christianity continued to make decisions on matters of faith as well as administration long after the Seventh Council. However, the basis of Christian faith and order was formulated by the ecumenical councils of the imperial church. As such, they represent a significant part of the common heritage shared by all Christendom, East and West alike. Under the protective auspices of the emperor, and with the singular contribution of stellar theologians, the seven councils interpreted and clarified the fundamental dogma and doctrine, which, along with the scriptures, form the cornerstone of orthodox belief. What helped to make all this possible was the close integration that existed in Byzantium between church and state. The two of them interdependent, but neither subordinated to the other. The emperor was understood to be no merely earthly ruler, but God's representative. This meant that he had responsibilities in the religious sphere. There were certainly times when the emperors exceeded their authority, when they tried to interfere directly in matters of doctrine. 
On such occasions, the church leaders and the monks made it clear that the church had a mind and will of its own. From the moment the church was born, there were always people who bore witness that the kingdom of God is not a kingdom of this earth. They served as a constant reminder that Byzantium was a mere symbol of the kingdom of heaven, not itself the reality. Some of them rose to prominence as the great defenders of orthodoxy. These men of extraordinary holiness are collectively known as the great fathers of the church. Countless others, perhaps less known but no less saintly, made their presence eternally felt by word, deed, or sacrifice. Almost all of them were nurtured and sustained by the monastic movement to become the enduring conscience of the earthly church. Monasticism as a fully developed institution did not exist before the fourth century. It grew gradually as a retreat from Christian complacency and ethical decadence brought about by the legalization of the faith. To a lesser extent, it was also a reaction against excessive imperial interference in the internal affairs of the church. Monastic settlements blossomed in the deserts of Egypt, Syria, and Palestine, and later in the rocky formations of Cappadocia in Asia Minor, and much later at Metera in central Greece. But since the 10th century, the center of Monastic life has been a rocky peninsula in northern Greece, Mount Athos, the holy mountain. In an age where blood martyrdom was preempted by legalization of the faith, monks and nuns, ascetics and hermits became the martyrs, subjecting themselves to self-denial, absolute obedience, and total seclusion. For the church in Constantinople, the middle of the 9th century was the start of intensive missionary activity. Restricted by the Oriental Orthodox churches and the rise of Islam to the east, and by increasingly strained relations with the Roman Latin church to the west, Patriarch Photius the Great dispatched two Greeks to the north to convert the Slavic peoples. Cyril and Methodius, brothers from Thessaloniki, took Christianity outside the comfortable boundaries of the Byzantine Empire and into an alien environment. Cyril and Methodius were determined to establish a native ministry. They developed a special alphabet from the Greek to translate the gospel and write service books in Slavonic. The written culture of the Slavs was born, allowing Slavic civilization to prosper. The Slavs were Christianized and civilized at the same time. They were given a fully articulated Christian doctrine in their own language and a fully developed Christian civilization. As a result, churches in Bulgaria, Serbia, and eventually in Romania and Russia thrived within natural national boundaries. For instance, in 927, less than a full century since Slavs first heard the gospel, the Bulgarian Orthodox Church was recognized by Constantinople as an independent autocephalous patriarchate. In 988, Russia officially became a Christian state with the conversion of Vladimir, ruler of Kiev. By that time, all the powerful states surrounding Kiev had abandoned paganism and adopted some form of monotheism. Vladimir wanted to do the same, so he sent envoys abroad to observe the rituals of Islam, Roman Catholicism, and Orthodoxy. The envoys were overwhelmed by the beauty of the Greek Orthodox rites they witnessed in the church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. When they returned to Kiev and gave their report, Vladimir decided to adopt the Byzantine form of Christianity and decreed that all his subjects be baptized in that faith. Few people have accepted the Orthodox faith with as much devotion as the Slavs. Their conversion was a pivotal event in their social growth and cultural progress.
with the turn of the 5th century, a succession of developments triggered the total collapse of political unity in the Mediterranean world. First, the empire was once more divided, this time permanently, into separate realms. The Byzantine East centered in Constantinople, the Latin West in Rome, each with its own emperor. Soon after, barbarians, wave after wave of Germanic tribes, Goths, Vandals and Franks, invaded from the north to carve up the once proud western half of the Roman Empire into so many separate feudal kingdoms. The last remnants of political solidarity between Greek-speaking East and Latin West were destroyed, never to be restored. During the reign of Justinian in the 6th century, while the West was still divided and in a constant state of conflict, the Byzantine Empire was rising to the height of its glory. Constantinople gained both prominence and influence. Justinian's gift to the world, the Church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, is perhaps the ultimate expression of Byzantine symphonia, a unique harmony between church and state. On the one hand, an imperial church attending to matters divine, guarding the state. On the other hand, a Christian empire presiding over mortals as protector of the church to preserve the faith. In such an environment, the Bishop of Constantinople, by tradition direct successor of Andrew, the first apostle of Christ and founder of the Church of Byzantium, assumed the title of Ecumenical Patriarch. He came to be recognized as spokesman and spiritual leader for Eastern Orthodoxy. Rome, based on ecumenical canon, objected, but to no avail. Political power and prestige had decisively shifted to the East. In the East, bishops of many local churches legitimately claimed a direct, unbroken apostolic succession. No less than four of them had been elevated by ecumenical council decree to prominent honorary status. Consequently, Eastern Orthodoxy evolved as a decentralized affiliation of co-equal bishops, subscribing to decision by consensus under the protection of a single, strong, secular head, the Emperor of Byzantium. On the other hand, in the West, in an unstable political environment, Rome alone could claim an apostolic foundation. As a result, the Ecclesia or Church of Rome developed a centralized structure. Slowly, religious as well as secular authority was concentrated in the office of the Pope, the Bishop of Rome. Linguistic obstacles compounded the problem, making communication even more complex and difficult. By the 7th century, very few in the West could read Greek, and although Byzantium still called itself the Roman Empire, it was a rare Byzantine who knew Latin, the language of the Romans. With the advent of Islam in the 7th and 8th centuries, the Mediterranean fell under Arab control, and cultural and commercial contacts between Rome and the prominent seats of Eastern Patriarchates started to deteriorate. Cut off from Byzantium and the Eastern Mediterranean, the West proceeded to establish a new Holy Roman Empire of its own, independent and emancipated from the Byzantines. To that effect, at the onset of the 9th century, the Pope crowned a new emperor, Charlemagne. Supported by a succession of popes, Charlemagne, former king of the Franks, attacked the legitimacy of the Eastern Empire in an attempt to take sole control of the Christian world and thus restore the empire in the West. The stage was set for an open conflict. The pretext for the confrontation, known as the Fortian Schism, was the encounter of Orthodox and German missionaries among the Slavs but its roots ran far deeper. The fundamental difference between East and West lay in assorted matters of ecumenical dogma and canon. Two key issues in particular. The first issue was the Roman understanding of papal primacy in the affairs of the church. Rome openly asserted its claims of jurisdictional supremacy in the middle of the ninth century. Pope Nicholas I tried to intervene in the internal affairs of the Byzantine church by ordering the deposition of Patriarch Photios the Great and the restoration of Patriarch Ignatius to the throne of Constantinople. 
At about the same time, the convergence of missionary activity among the Slavs in the plains of Eastern Europe brought to the surface the second issue, a long dormant controversy over the filioque. The Nicene Creed had clearly defined the Holy Spirit as the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. But the Latin West unilaterally added a phrase to read who proceeds from the Father and from the Son, in Latin filioque, disturbing the balance of the Holy Trinity as defined by the first two ecumenical councils. St. Photius the Great, a widely acclaimed scholar, regarded as one of the towering figures of orthodoxy, was eventually restored to the Patriarchate. Although Photius had played a key role in the growth of tension between East and West, during his second term of office, he entered into a reconciliation with Rome. It was at best, however, a fragile peace. In less than 100 years, following minor incidental conflicts, Cardinal Humbert, a high-ranking representative from Rome, placed a stamp of excommunication on the altar of Hagia Sophia at Constantinople prompting the Orthodox Church to respond with anathemas of its own. This action marks what is commonly accepted as the beginning of the Great Schism. It was the year 1054 AD. However, some level of friendly relations was in fact maintained, as men of good conscience on both sides continued to hope that the gap separating them could be bridged. History proved differently. Of all things, the Crusades, organized and launched by the Holy Roman Empire to liberate the regions of the Eastern Christian Empire from the occupation of the Arabs, ultimately sealed the schism. On their fourth campaign, the year 1204, the Crusaders sacked Constantinople. They destroyed churches. They desecrated altars. They pillaged holy relics. The Crusaders as Sir Stephen Runciman, the historian, has said, brought not peace but a sword, and that sword was to sever Christendom. The East Orthodox world has never forgotten the appalling sack of Constantinople by the Fourth Crusade. This meant that the long-standing doctrinal disagreements were now reinforced by an intense national hatred, by resentment of what was felt to be Western aggression and Western sacrilege. The Crusaders deposed the Ecumenical Patriarch and installed in his place Latin leadership. For half a century, Eastern Orthodoxy languished under Latin occupation the Latinocratia. Devastated by the impact, Byzantines complained that even roving bands of uncivilized Arabs, the Saracens, are merciful and kind compared to these men who bear the cross of Christ on their shoulders. The Byzantine Empire never really recovered from the fall of 1204, although it survived for another two and a half centuries, agonizing at the sight of losing ground to the Ottoman menace. In 1439, at the Council of Florence, in an attempt to end the schism that had torn East and West apart, both Eastern Orthodoxy and Byzantium capitulated to Roman supremacy. Both agreed to a union with the Catholic Church and the Holy Roman Empire in exchange for military support to defend against the threat of advancing Ottoman Turks. The so-called Union of Florence, however, was short-lived. In response to swift, loud public outcry, it was immediately repudiated. On the 7th of April, 1453, the Ottomans, spurred by the dreams of Mohammed the Conqueror, launched a massive attack on Constantinople by land and by sea. Hopelessly outnumbered, the Byzantines mount a valiant but futile defense, enduring a relentless siege of bombardment and wave after wave of assault. Still, 
the city holds for seven long weeks. Before daybreak on May 29, Christian services are held in the Church of Hagia Sophia for the last time. Ironically, on that tragic moment, Orthodox and Roman Catholics, setting their differences aside, gather to pray together, united. Emperor Constantine Paleologos, 80th successor to Constantine the Great, rejects pleas to flee. Instead, he falls fighting by the side of his men on the ramparts of the once mighty walls. The Sultan Mehmet is said to have shed tears of compassion at the sight of plunder and destruction that he and his men had wrought. Church bells fall silent, not to toll again for another four centuries. Hagia Sophia, the most renowned symbol of Orthodox Christianity, is converted to a Muslim mosque. Before long, the Muslim criers chant reverberates from minarets all across the Orthodox world. In a matter of few years, the glorious Byzantine Empire was no more. And with it, the Orthodox Church outside Russia entered an era of oppression and persecution.